Hi, I'm uh, Mike Frisbee from City Church, Cambridge. I'm one of the elders there. I've been there about 15 years now. And uh, at City Church, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, we've sent some 11 families and seven singles uh, out into cross-cultural mission uh, across the world on many of the world's continents, uh, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, uh, South America. Um, eight of those uh, kind of units have gone to churches or church plants uh, to do with New Frontiers. Um, six of them have gone with mission agencies. And uh, then three folk have gone in actually finding work placements from their firms here in the UK uh, to go and work overseas. And uh, two of those have actually gone uh, again to be part of church plants uh, in overseas countries with their work placement. And then one of our guys is actually one of the top uh, Bible uh, consultants in the world. And uh, he was originally placed in Nigeria, but now in Switzerland. And uh, he travels the world and uh, helping with uh, various translations, but particularly at this moment of time, uh, working with Muslim uh, translations for Muslim people. Uh, so that's something of uh, uh, you know what we've been up to. And I guess this video really is to try and uh, share with you some of the things that we've learned through the years, some of the mistakes we've made, and uh, some of the sort of practice that we have now, which has uh, come over sort of working uh, things through over numbers of years. Uh, just to make it simple, I thought uh, uh, the, the old preacher's way, I thought I'd make it five E's for us, uh, just to help you uh, memorize that. So I'm gonna talk about ethos, encouragement, exiting, engagement and entering. So the first of those is uh, ethos. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that if you're really going to be effective uh, in sending and supporting people, uh, then you have to build a whole church uh, involvement. Uh, sending folk out, supporting them overseas can't be just the domain of uh, one elder who's got a special interest in that or that little bunch that you often find in churches that are really keen on overseas mission and are always wanting to uh, see the church do more, or even in fact, uh, friends or family, which of course is often the natural way of those that would support. It really has to be a whole church uh, involvement. And uh, I would say that one of the things that uh, we've learned through the years is if you don't create a, a world mission atmosphere, sending and supporting will die or become ineffective. So what are some of the ways that we've uh, tried to create an ethos uh, within the church for world mission and cross-cultural mission? Well, I think uh, one of the first elements has been in our preaching and teaching. It's obvious that uh, from Genesis to Revelation, when you read the scriptures, that God has always had a heart to have people from every tribe and tongue and nation uh, standing before his throne and worshiping him. And uh, one of the things it's good to remember too, that uh, even though you can know that, uh, it's really important to uh, really introduce that into your preaching, not just kind of set passages that really talk about world mission, but in everyday preaching, um, Sunday by Sunday, we always try and touch in some way or another about God's heart uh, for the nation. So building that into your preaching and teaching uh, is one of the things that we've found really effective. Another thing would be trying to make the church itself have uh, come to a global outlook. It's interesting how often we become very parochial, very kind of turned in on our own community or just the things that we're involved in ourselves. It's a natural thing uh, for people, but we need to build a, a global outlook uh, for people. One of the things that I, um, I'm still surprised about when in my own church, I have to say that, but also um, in other churches where I visit to preach is that often there can be something happening in the world. Say, for example, like the recent explosion in, in Beirut, in Lebanon. And uh, when you attend uh, that, that, that Sunday service, it, you find there's not a mention uh, of what's gone on and, uh, and let alone praying for it and uh, being concerned about it. And so one of the things we've tried to do through the years is that, is that when things are happening around the world, we try and talk about those um, sometime when we gather together, whether it's midweek or whether it's on a Sunday, and we'll often pray uh, for that situation. And one of the things that does is, again, it, it builds people to realize 
that their prayers can be effective. They can touch the world and touch the heart of God as, as well uh, when we pray. And so trying to develop that global outlook, people thinking wider than their own scene has, has been very uh, important. Another thing uh, which has helped create the right atmosphere is, is the encouragement of visits by apostolic and prophetic people. Uh, one of the things about those giftings is that they come with a, a, often a, a big picture uh, kind of vision of what God is about in the world. Often uh, because they are, are moving around between churches and even overseas, often they've got stories of how the church is doing in other parts of the world, visits they've made. Uh, but more than that, they are able to inspire and to impart something uh, when they come. And so we try regularly uh, to have apostolic prophetic folk come and, and teach. Uh, and we find that that, again, just lifts people's eyes uh, to see God's great purposes um, in, in the world. Also, of course, uh, one of the things we, we try and do is that uh, if we know uh, people are visiting from our New Frontiers churches or other churches from across the world, if we know they're around, then again, we try and uh, get hold of them uh, so that they uh, can come and preach. There's nothing like having somebody from a, another ethnic group around the world come in the flesh, as it were, and just share the word of God. It, it does something for the hearts and minds and outlook uh, of your people. And one of the things we've done is not only um, having visitors, but we also try and ensure that uh, uh, preachers, ethnic preachers from here in the UK also come as visiting preachers. So again, it, it helps the church to just feel part uh, of the world, if I could uh, uh, put it that way. So really important to do that. Secondly, encouragement. Um, I would say one of the things uh, that we've learned is that when people start to, just with that little spark of thinking about, uh, is God really calling me to go overseas? That's, is that something that I should do? That we need to really get involved with people as early as possible, uh, really to fan that, that spark into a flame. Often when folks start to get stirred, there's often doubts in their mind. Is this God? Is this me? Should I go? Should I not? And so being alongside them, giving them encouragement, books to read, introducing them to people, sharing with them what's going on. Uh, all those kind of things are, are really vital uh, and Im important. Also, encouragement is very needed with uh, folk who are, are feeling that sense of being drawn to go and serve God overseas because there are, will be people around who when they start to hear about that, you know, it will sometimes so doubt in people's lives or you get, you know, those kind of comments of, you know, oh, surely you're not going to give up your career that you've worked so hard for and going out to do this. So can you really take your children away from your grandparents? Is it really safe to go? And so people need lots and lots of encouragement because often dampening down things are thrown at them uh, in, in those early days. Also, it needs a lot of encouragement uh, for people we've found because that preparation period before they uh, once they get that sense of God wants me to go overseas to when they actually make it overseas can be quite a long period of preparation, of training, of getting ready. And so it's very easy to get discouraged. I can think of some of folks who have had to go back and study some more and uh, get new uh, degrees and so forth so that they can actually work in the country where they want to be. And that can be a really testing time. So constant encouragement is important. And then exiting. One of the things that you must have in place is, is people's finances. Uh, discussing with them, making sure that they're going to be okay in terms of the supply of uh, finances, whether they help self-finance or whether the church get, contributes. Uh, we found over the years that we've had a kind of a tier system whereby um, we give priority to uh, those who are wanting to engage in church plants with our New Frontiers family. Um, and then, you know, we come down the scale with those maybe working with agencies, maybe we give them a little bit less. Um, we try and judge it on, on a personal level, but we found it's really good to think through as an eldership group, you know, where your priority of your money is going to go to. And, and of course, one of the important things too is that you not only help set a budget with them before they exit, but uh, you actually uh, review in the future. You know, uh, inflation goes up everywhere. Uh, you know, you send people out, uh, just a couple and a baby. 
and within a few years you know it's now four people four air flights back home or travel whatever it might be and so you do need to we've learned we, we need to regularly review those kind of uh, financial uh, aspects that's that's really uh, important and then other little things like holidays bringing folk back for conferences uh, leadership conferences uh, we've tried to do that through the years so that they still feel very much part of what's going on in terms of, of, of the wider family and then it's really important to establish uh, when you're sending folk out who's got the apostolic responsibility uh, in the church plant uh, who's got pastoral responsibility sometimes when you're sending people out to um, and establish uh, new frontiers work uh, much of the pastoral care will, will go on there if they're going into a virgin church plant maybe that you need to have much more hands-on uh, sort of pastoral care. And then I would say um, a public sending is really important. It not only, again, um, underlines that it's not that we're sending these people off to do the thing that uh, they want to do, but there's a real partnership. And so prayer and prophecy sending out. We know many of our folk have uh, said how important the prophetic words on their sending out have been to them. That like Timothy, they've been able to wage a good warfare. Uh, because of the words that have been spoken over on and uh, even when they come home from break sometimes we always again try and make a point of sending them out publicly and again having time to pray and prophesy over them and then engagement um, very important uh, that as elders we have contact with those that are going out that it's not out of uh, sight out of mind uh, but I would say the thing that we've learned um, through the years, we made ba bad mistakes in the beginning, uh, is that you need to diarise when you're going to have communication and contact with them. You need to get that in the diary. Uh, if you try and leave it to ad hoc, oh, I'll, I'll get in touch with them. Oh, yeah, I'll give them a phone call sometime. I'll, I'll WhatsApp them. Uh, it doesn't usually work well. And so you must diarise there. And you, we must try and also, uh, when folks are actually out on the field, um, keep them before the church. Uh, bringing news of what's what they're doing, uh, using all the kind of modern technology we can now with Zoom and WhatsApp and so forth is much easier. We've got many WhatsApp groups uh, that are put together, folk who've got a, a real interest uh, in what folk are doing, but we try and bring it to the corporate body much more. Uh, new members joining the church, we try and make them aware of folk that have been uh, sent out and we'll always focus them in terms of our, our corporate prayer meetings. And, and can I say, you know, to ensure that there's good friendship. Friendship is a two-way thing. And uh, one of the things I've always encouraged our folk to do is to keep up the friendships back home. So it's not only just for our own folk in the church, you know, making sure that they keep the friendships up, those we send out have to keep the friendship as well. And so I've always encouraged them to, uh, you know, not just talk about ministry, but talk about their days. So one of our couples in the Middle East uh, always has a section a day uh, in the life of, uh, where they just talk about things they've been up to that and that gives a real contact in terms of uh, humanity and then entry ca coming back um, you need to give folk uh, multiple opportunities to share their story in the church family so we've learned that when folk come back we give them opportunity uh, in, in the main service they go into the children they go into the young people and uh, we just have time with them so that they can just uh, share um, we, we've set up now what we call a new member social so that when folks come home, um, we gather together all the people that have joined the church since they went out overseas so that they can meet new people and so that that connection uh, can be made. Debriefing them is very, very uh, important, important for them so that they can get closure on the period that they've just been serving over overseas, talking about future plans and goals and training that may be needed for the future. And just as um, it's needed in sending out uh, and uh, in debriefing when it comes back, don't forget the children. Uh, remember uh, talking with one leader in London who was going overseas in the new church plant and I met him a couple of months before he was due to go and I said, you know, what preparation have you done with your children? And he, he looked blank at me, why should I prepare my children? And uh, preparing children and also debriefing them when they come back, how they've got on. Um, uh, so that they can get closure as well it is really vital and important so what would be one or two key things that i would uh, leave with you well just to say that uh, uh, the u.s army said that in the gulf war they needed 20 support personnel uh, to keep one person fighting uh, on the front uh, in the field and the u.s army said it, that, that support was indispensable 
not an optional extra. And uh, I would say that's really, really important. So can I say just a couple of points to finish? Language, try and use the language of partnership uh, even more. I probably shot my, myself in the foot, you know, even talking to you now, but it's easy to talk about support. But Paul in Philippians uh, 1 talks about partnership. Try and get into the language of partnership. So it's not uh, someone's out there doing something for God. No, we're in this together. And you must build that sense of partnership. It is a spiritual battle and therefore prayer is absolutely vital. And uh, we need to get as much prayer going as we can. And uh, one leader I, I met recently was saying that uh, his experience is that those that uh, don't do so well when they go out cross culture are those who don't really have a, a big peer backing uh, to, to keep them in the spiritual battle. Remember, it takes time and resources uh, when you're sending folk overseas. And so you've got to be prepared for that and the cost of that. Uh, because as I said, it's easy to turn in on ourselves and be parochial. And obviously, like in any other area of church life, uh, we've found that good leadership in this particular area of uh, sending and supporting and encouraging and keeping uh, behind folks who are serving outside is, is absolutely vital. So I hope those few things may uh, be of help to you. God bless you.